It's November 98. Nokia has the largest global market share for mobiles. John Howard has just been re-elected Australia's Prime Minister. A group of PhD students have just founded a small tech startup. It's called Google. And Valve's small development team has just released what we're going to become one of the most historic and genre-defining shooters of the industry. Half-Life. Only a few months prior, in March, a young woman was stuck in a hospital bed screaming in a kind of agony I don't wish to imagine, pushing out a little baby boy. Me. Seems like it's been a big year then. Two major releases, one of them being me, which my mum really loved, and the other being Half-Life 1, which caught the attention of just about everybody else in the world who was playing video games at the time. Following its release, the game was universally praised, received a number of awards, and it was, even to this day is, considered by some to be the greatest video game of all time. By the end of 2008, a decade later, the game had sold over 9 million copies. For the time, that was huge numbers. It cemented its developer Valve's place in an industry where today, it remains one of the most recognizable brands out there. In short, it did well both commercially and critically. Certainly, it's had more commercial and critical success than I have in the last 25 years, that's for sure. So I figured with all that in mind, and with all the love and admiration I've heard over the years for this franchise and its other hit games, why not give this game a shot? 25 years still counts as fashionably late, right? Well, that's exactly what I did. A full playthrough of the original campaign start to finish on hard. And what do I think of this absolute pillar of the gaming industry, this beacon of game design, this genre-defining masterpiece of the ages? Yeah, it's actually still pretty good. People were right. There's certainly some good and some bad. In some ways, I feel like this game is timeless. And in other ways, the weight of its age was a bit too much to overcome. I think the most obvious and initial standout to me was just how insanely technically sound everything was. The game didn't crash a single time, in fact I can barely recall seeing anything resembling an obvious bug or glitch now that I think about it. With a game this immersive, it's something that really only crosses your mind after the credits roll, but not once did I experience anything of a game-breaking issue that stalled progress, ruined immersion, or was a general inconvenience. This is, at least in the AAA landscape of today, something that is almost unheard of. Now, I'm aware that there was a 25th anniversary edition patch that did receive a couple of major bug fixes, so I'm sure my experience with that is different to most old school fans, but regardless, it was refreshing to have an experience that was, without fail, stable. Now, that's not to say there wasn't some interesting moments. Oh, dude. For the most part, everything in the game felt like it was bolted right. Collision was good, weapons felt sharp, snappy, and effective, movement was... A little dated, sure, as those ladders especially, but it never felt overly cumbersome. Enemy AI in particular was a standout to me, especially for the time. It made for really tense engagements. A standout for me was the stealth soldiers, which were ungodly frustrating to fight, but also really damn fun. I was actually reminded a fair bit of the stalkers from The Last of Us Part 2, which is crazy to me considering that game released over 20 years later. I think though what struck me beyond anything else with Half-Life was its distinctly handcrafted feel. In a time where the games industry and its biggest hitters begin crumbling under the weight of their own financial dominance, it's refreshing to travel back to a time where games were deeply human creations. Although not every design decision in Half-Life 1 appeals to me and my modern sensibilities, I can tell that these decisions were made by people with real passion who wanted to create their game. The helicopter level, for example, was slightly too long for my taste. Some of the layouts were a bit frustrating to navigate, sure, but at no point, at least in the first half in the game, did the levels ever feel boring. The game understands and seems to have built a lot of the modern understanding that part of what makes a great immersive sim is the focused design. Make your game too linear, without any avenues for exploration or experimentation, then it just becomes another first-person corridor shooter. However, and perhaps more importantly 25 years later, make a game too large and sprawling, and then you run the risk of each individual piece lacking the attention to detail that makes immersive sims engaging in the first place. It's obvious that Half-Life strikes this balance really well, and playing through I can very clearly see the inspiration for some of the games that I know and love that released many years later. The plot and tone take an approach that echoes this philosophy, not trying to do too much or provide a larger-than-life tale with dozens of intermingled character arcs, 
Instead, it is a reserved form of storytelling, preferring to use subtle visual cues or small hints of dialogue to nudge the player and direct their imagination towards attempting to fill in the gaps. I'll admit, even after seeing the credits roll, I don't really have much of a clue about the details of what's actually going on, but it never mattered because there was enough breadcrumbs to keep me hooked. I'm sure if I was really dedicated, I could go back and really attempt to find all of the subtle clues and paint a better picture, and that's the beauty. In the same way that its level design never felt like it was overextending its limit despite pushing boundaries, its narrative was attempting to paint a larger picture without doing so obviously to create boredom or disrespect my intelligence in any way. Gordon doesn't need to hear all this. He's a highly trained professional. We've assured the administrator that nothing will go wrong. Without spoiling anything, the game's ending did leave me far more confused than when I started, which I think if it was 1998 would have been a little bit disappointing, but thankfully I've lived about half my life hearing about how amazing the sequel is. So it's more something to look forward to than anything else. That being said, I don't think it's a perfect game by any stretch. It's all well and good to put things into the context of the time, and I think that's important, but nevertheless, I am playing this game today, and I'm looking at it from my own modern perspective. It's something that I can't help. And from that lens, I can notice some clear flaws. First of all, the save system. I played the game on hard, so I guess, yeah, you can make the argument that I was kind of asking for it, but there were a few moments in the game where I was almost practically softlocked due to the sparse resources, high damage, and dated save system of the time. I distinctly remember one autosave transition between chapters where I had only realized in hindsight that I had misused a quicksave, and then I was stuck with about seven health and no ammo at the beginning of the next chapter. I was then locked in a room with a fence and about 15 million exploding squid dogs who, you guessed it, did more than 7 damage. What transpired was a nightmarish game of whack-a-mole as I attempted to stop each squid dog from exploding and killing me while they frantically ran around all different directions. Oh, and the fence, by the way, it was electric, because of course it was. Now, had I known about this area prior, or had the game been a bit more thought out in terms of its resources and auto-saving, which in most other cases it actually was, I'd not be in this situation at all. There were several moments like this though, where the game's save system and its interaction with the level design began to show its age, and I began to show mine, not being used to how these systems worked and often quick saving myself into bad situations. A good save system is the kind of thing we really take for granted these days. It's kind of like sound or music. The best kind is the kind that goes unnoticed. But going through this certainly reminded me of its importance and its value in modern games today. My other issue I had was mainly with the game's pacing, particularly going through the last third of its campaign. I can't pinpoint specifics as much as I'd like to, but I had the feeling throughout the game's final act that levels and fights were just dragging on a little bit too long. Maybe it was the fact that by this point, Half-Life had really shown most if not all of its cards and what it had to offer in terms of gameplay but I also felt that the later levels were just a little less interesting to explore for me. As Gordon became more and more loaded with weapons, the game shifted from a slower, more deliberate tactical shooter to a more frantic one, almost akin to something like Doom. Like, I enjoy fast-paced shooters, but in this context, it didn't really feel like it fit, especially with how stellar the earlier points of the game felt with their slower approach. It led to levels feeling like they had less nuance and thought put into them, even if that wasn't the case because I was just blasting through them at breakneck pace, constantly being bombarded by hard-hitting enemies and frantic encounters. It felt like I was given a little less time to breathe and appreciate the atmosphere than I had before at the start of the game. Speaking of the final act, I want to touch on Zen. Zen is the alien dimension that encompasses the game's finale. Look, I'm going to be really honest here, I didn't like Zen. The slight complaints I just mentioned about the later third of the game were really apparent to me in Zen. Levels in Zen felt strangely placed and poorly thought out. The jetpack, though it was a neat idea, was kind of unlike the rest of Gordon's kit, not able to be used in interesting ways since beyond just floating platforms, the levels didn't really feature anything that demanded intelligent and thought out use of the kit. And yes, I'll be the first to admit that flying around combat encounters with the thing was pretty damn fun, but it does go back to that issue of now the breakneck pace of combat was counter to what I had appreciated about the game to begin with, taking in its atmosphere and 
looking at all the subtle clues. Not that there was really much to take in here, to be honest. I enjoyed the mystery of seeing the Lambda surveyors scattered around and in general liked the look, save for a few eye-melting textures. But beyond a few sites here and there, Zen was a far cry from many of the other areas which featured some extremely rich and compelling visual storytelling that was almost always prodding your imagination as you attempt to put the pieces together of what's really going on. Also, this is a more personal thing, but I really felt like Zen could have done with just some slight music, like, you know, nothing crazy, but a little bit of ambiance could have gone a long way here. It was an oddly quiet place without any alarms or sounds of machinery to break the silence like before. Which brings me to the final boss. The game's final boss also wasn't exactly thrilling, but then again, my expectations were fairly low here. Even after 25 years, bosses is something that the immersive sim genre has always struggled with. I would be okay if these kind of games didn't actually have bosses at all, at least not in the traditional sense. It's the kind of gameplay formula that just doesn't suit in my opinion. It had some interesting ideas, but it wasn't really enjoyable in the end. Credit where credit is due though, it was creative. Creativity being the thing that never really faded up until the final credits. 2024 is a pretty tough time to be searching for creativity and boundary pushing AAA technical innovation. At least it certainly feels that way. I'm glad that the indie scene remains a strong anchor for these kind of games that carry on trends that began all these years ago. But don't get me wrong, going back to the classics does have its charm and I'm more than glad that I did. But to me, despite the greatness of the originals, it's the next new experience that will always be the more exciting one for me. The kind of games that take the DNA from the pioneers and mold them into something new and something special. Speaking of brand new experiences, I think it's about time I stop talking and go play Half-Life 2. A 20 year old game. A 20? Really? A 20 year old? Oh my god it is.